Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. We have Steven Schlesinger and uh, he is actually, he's started on Wall Street. He became a New York tour guide. So he's the guy that you used to uh, see on top of the bus. So he actually has an array of lectures. So at the end of this, we're actually, for those that are here, please stay on. We're gonna do a poll and we're gonna choose what uh, Mr. Schlesinger is going to uh, talk about in April, okay? So he is now, obviously you know, from talking with him, he is an avid golfer. He golfs about four times a week. Uh, his wife likes to golf as well. And he, and we are so, and he does know, he'll tell us about the connection that he has to Glen Eagles. And I just want to uh, thank Mr. Schlesinger for coming tonight. And thank you, it's all yours. Okay, so hold on, we're gonna figure this out, share screen. Yeah. And, okay. There you go. Okay. Looks like, it, looks like it's great. All right. Say hello. Oh, uh, hello. Uh, I thank uh, Tammy for her very kind introduction. Um, I do have a number of friends at uh, Glen Eagles. Um, we were mostly members of Shelter Rock Tennis Club. For those of you who might have lived on Long Island or in the or in, in the city, I lived in in Manhattan and traveled out to play tennis there for a number of years. Uh, prior to moving down here in about 2008. And as Tammy told you, I was the guy on the top of the bus for about a year until we moved down here. And I could tell you in this kind of weather, that would have been a nightmare um, mm -hmm. to try and work through the uh, winter season. But we're down here and it's a blessing that we can play tennis and golf and, and whatever. And we're all hoping that, uh, you know, better times health-wise are coming. So let me begin. Um, okay. Now, why am I not getting? Um, why am I not getting it moving? Oh, there we go. Uh, this is just quick. I mean, the pilgrims came voluntarily um, in the early 1600s. Uh, they were immigrants. Um, Slaves came, not, not willingly necessarily, about 600,000. Um, and then I'm gonna talk, well, it's just another picture. Why do immigrants come to America? And this was really a consistent from the very beginning. Religious, racial, or political persecution, lack of economic uh, opportunities, famine, contract labor agreements, railroad companies advertised free or uh, cheap farmland. They used to put posters out. Um, directing people to trains that went to, to Texas and various parts in the Midwest um, and brought immigrants away from the coast. Um, mass immigration began from about 1840 to 1860 when 4 million Irish and Germans immigrated to America, same thing. They came for higher wages in the industrial area, the potato blight, which really affected the Germans nearly as much as the Irish. Um, 1845 to 1844, uh, uh, brought a million and a half um, Irish wow. here, and low fares on transatlantic ships made access easy, made it possible uh, for Europeans to come to the United States. So first I'm gonna talk about Castle Clinton. Um, Castle Clinton was originally a fort, which was built in about between 1811 and 1812 to keep out the British and protect uh, New York Harbor. It never saw a lot of battle. Uh, and by 1824, uh, the army gave Castle Clinton or Fort Clinton um, to New York City. And they changed the name to Castle Gardens. Now, uh, a couple of years ago, I was given this lecture and after the lecture, a, a gentleman came up to me and he says, I gotta thank you. And why, was he, why is he gonna thank me? Because I talked about Castle Gardens and he said, I only knew Kessel Gardens because the uh, Yiddish speaking couldn't say Kessel Gardens, they said Kessel Gardens and he could never find a history of Kessel Gardens. Um, and so uh, if you're 
ancestors uh, spoke Yiddish, you might have account, uh, encountered the term Kessel Gardens. Um, so this is Kessel Gardens, which was the first federal, well, no, actually run by New York State in New York City, the first organized immigration station in the United States. Prior to the eight, 1855, uh, people just came into the country. They didn't have to. Uh, they didn't have to fill out forms and so forth. Um, this is Kessel Gardens. When when they uh, changed with the uh, they, when the army took over, they put a roof on the top of the fort, and it became a an entertainment venue. For instance, Jenny Lynn, who is known to, uh, as the uh, Swedish Nightingale, came and did her first performance at Castle Gardens. P.T. Barnum brought her over here. He saw an opportunity to make money and he brought uh, Jenny Lynn over here. They had a uh, parting of the ways after about two years, but that's the kind they had Italian opera um, on a regular basis. They had vendors um, and uh, you know, small restaurants and so forth. Um, and Castle Gardens, approximately 10 million immigrants mostly from Northern and Western Europe passed through Castle Gardens from 1885 to 1890 when it closed. Uh, and the immigration process uh, was um, run by New York State. And so you got 10 million people. They came from 26 different countries. And some of the famous people who came through Castle Gardens were Emma Goldman, for instance, uh, Nicholas Tesla, Andrew Carnegie, and a man named Friedrich Trumpf, T-R-U-M-P-F, who turned out to be the grandfather of the US, recent US president. He came through uh, Castle Gardens. And this is just a picture of the crowd outside of um, Castle Gardens. It was a very disorganized facility. Um, there were all kinds of um, hucksters, whether they were money changers or uh, they were telling people they could get them apartments, they would uh, take them from Ellis Island to wherever, um, and it never happened. So this was a, a very dangerous place. And here you see Castle Garden uh, down in the upper uh, sort of lower left side, and um, it was right in the harbor right outside the battery. Um, and uh, this is just uh, you know one of many uh, photographs of it. Some of them are lithographs, some of uh, different varieties. And this was the Great Hall, just like later on, you're gonna see the Great Hall on Ellis Island. And it was noisy and it was filthy uh, and it reeked. Um, and, and so it was not a very congenial or accepting um, a place. And there you just see the crowds there. And here's Castle Gardens. And you can see the labor exchange, uh, the Ward's Island, because people were sick when they came over here. Uh, in that period of time, in the early 1850s, most of the trips from Europe to the United States were on sailing ships. And it could take up to 42 days or so to make the trip. So people, you know, came here, um, and and many of them were were ill and needed attention. So they had a wards department, they had a hospital, um, and here's just a cartoon that appeared during those days, and it showed the um, the crookedness, the uh, uh, thievery, and so forth. You had money exchange, you had women with temp uh, tempresses, uh, confidence men. Uh, people who claimed to be from the old country and they could do them favors and so forth. But really one of the things that happened uh, is that many young women who came over were misled by these people and were then used um, in brothels uh, and so forth. The money they gave them were worthless. They offered them an apartment um, with uh, uh, two bedrooms and they were lucky if they shared one bedroom with multiple families. So uh, things got pretty bad uh, during that period of time. And there you just see no admittance for AIDS. 
And this is, uh, you know, just a nice kind of, I put this in, this guy's nice snowy picture, uh, which maybe is what it looks like today um, in Castle Gardens. Uh, the building itself is um, uh, still, still there. It was refurbished a number of years ago. Um, it is now where if you were going by uh, ferry to Liberty, to um, Statue of Liberty or Ellis Island, you would buy your tickets at this facility, the same old facility that had been there for many years. So it's still in use. And to give you a picture of what it looks like in the harbor, in New York Harbor. And there's, there's uh, Castle Gardens, uh, as it is more or less today. It is right on the water, beautiful views, not far from the uh, uh, Heritage Museum uh, down there on the Battery. And in, um, 19, in 1876, there was a huge fire there. Um, these are all old wooden buildings. There was a huge fire there. They lost a lot of uh, the records from the earlier days, whatever records they had. Around 1920, 1924, uh, oh, I'm sorry, 1840, uh, uh, so just before Castle Gardens opened up, uh, the ships that were bringing people over here were required to get a list of all the passengers. So for a while that existed, but much, much of it can't be found. But anyway, the fire was not so bad. Um, they had to close down for about a year and uh, they then uh, reopened. But the place uh, uh, really got bad reviews by the New York Times and so forth. And ultimately, uh, this is what cult, uh, class, uh, Castle Clinton looks like now. It's a uh, national monument um, and it's a recreation. I don't know how many of you, I, I should have asked earlier, how many of you went to, had ever gone to Ellis Island, the Statue of Liberty? Um, they, were, they are both part of the national park, the same national park, Statue of Liberty and uh, Ellis Island. And if you've been there in recent years, I was there two years ago and uh, they keep improving uh, their research facilities. They've created the rooms like they were back in the, uh, back in the 1860s, 1870s. Uh, and it's, a, it's part of, and Battery Park itself, by the way, is completely renovated. I mean, they got statues and all kinds of uh, flowers and so forth. It's a beautiful place right now. And then in 1890, because of the fire, um, uh, they closed uh, Cas uh, uh, Castle Gardens and um, used the barge office, which is right here, right on the water again. Um, they processed most of the uh, paperwork at the barge office. And when they needed to close uh, Castle Gardens, uh, they were able to process people through. But again, they didn't go through the same processes that they would ultimately do in uh, Ellis Island. Basically what happened was um, they, the, the ship would come in, not dock yet, and a couple of doctors would be rowed, would, you would row out to the ship and they'd go around and they'd ask people how they did and did anybody die, is anybody sick and so forth. But there was no formal procedures like there ultimately would be at Ellis Island. And when they closed Ellis Island in 1896, no, I'm sorry, the Castle Gardens um, in 1896, um, not they closed it before that, but from 1896 to 1957, the New York Aquarium occupied Castle Gardens. And it, it had 150 uh, specimens, and then ultimately, as if, I'm sure many of you are New Yorkers, but you would know where the museum, where the aquarium moved at that point in time to Brooklyn, on the water in Brooklyn, and that, of course, is a much um, more elaborate facility. And after Sand Hurricane Sandy, a lot of it was destroyed, and they've rebuilt it. Uh, so if you went uh, prior to that, uh, the the newer facility is really much more spectacular. And then I'm going to do just a little piece on uh, the Asian immigrants on the other side of the uh, continent. 
Chinese immigrants came to the United States after uh, they came because of the California gold rush in the 18, late 1840s. But right away, they faced pre prejudice from some Americans. The reason being that some Americans, uh, as you uh, hear today even, um, that the Asians were taking their jobs. So they had to pay a special tax, some were beaten and even killed. And then when the gold rush dried up, they looked for other work. Um, they helped to build the Transcontinental Railroad, for instance. Uh, the part which was built going from the uh, West Coast uh, to the middle of the country, and then the other side coming and meeting at Promontory Point and so forth. Um, they worked for low rate wages on the railroad so that they could stay in the United States. Uh, but in 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act because they didn't need them anymore, at least they felt they didn't need the Asians anymore. And that just put a 10 year ban on Asian immigration uh, to the United States. They just banned it. Um, then after that, um, in 1910, they did open up a immigration port in, on Angel, Angel Island, which is in San Francisco Bay. You can see it over the, towards the left of the picture. Um, just another picture. It's actually a beautiful setting. Um, I'll talk, it's still there. And they came on barges like, uh, uh, and big ships. And here you, you get an idea here. You see the inspector in the center of the picture. And he does not look like a very sympathetic guy uh, to a young Asian. And so the difficulties were there. And these are the kind of uh, buttoned up guys that were running uh, Angel Island. And about every six months or so, they would bring brides. The originals were only males. And just to give you a contrast, if you went to Chinatown in New York City in 1900 to 1910, there would only be about a thousand Chinese and 990 or so would be male. And so they only uh, imported brides uh, periodically during that period. Uh, and then when they were cleaning up the uh, wooden shacks that the uh, Asians were living on, they found on the walls a um, a bunch of poems and stories which told about the plight of the uh, Asians. The federal government opened a new immigration station in 1910, um, and the Asian uh, immigrants were held for lengthy interrogations to prove their identity before they could enter the country. And sometimes they were locked in barracks for weeks, and in some cases for years they were locked up before they were allowed. And here you have a picture of they, when they cleaned the, the inside of these wooden shacks, they found as they cleaned it, this, the poetry written in the Chinese uh, fashion. And I'll give you just one example, it's the same thing. And this is what one of them said. I am depressed that we Chinese are detained in this wooden building. It is actually racial barriers which cause difficulties on the island. Instead of remaining a citizen of China, I willingly became an ox. I intended to come to America to earn a living, but they couldn't do that because they couldn't get out of the place. And then in 1940, there was a big fire, just devastated all of the uh, buildings there. They rebuilt the facilities, but made them fireproof. And then if you probably know, one of the things they did there was they, uh, use it for the internment of Japanese and Chinese uh, uh, people during World War II. And that's what it looks like now. It is a national monument um, way out in the open, uh, as I said, right, in the, right into San Francisco Bay. And then we'll get to Ellis Island. Um, a man named Samuel Ellis purchased the island in the 1770s. And prior to becoming Ellis Island, the small island 
only 3.3 acres, had changed its names many times. Um, it was Gull Island, Little Oyster Island, and Gibbert Island, G-I-B-B-E-R-T. Does anybody know what a Gibbert is? I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and then in the early 20th century, the island was enlarged to 27 and a half acres, mostly landfill, interestingly enough, from the digging for the New York, uh, New York City subway system, which opened in 19, uh, 1904. This is what Gibbert Island, uh, Gibbert is a hanging pole. And they hanged uh, sailors uh, who were drunkards or you know, in some other way. And uh, it was also called Hanging Island. Nice, nice thing to be. Um, and then Ellis Island opened in 1892 after the close um, of um, Castle Gardens. Um, the federal government, now this became a federal property. And the first person, the first person to enter Ellis Island was a young woman. She looks a lot older in this statue, which is on Ellis Island. She was about 14 years old. Um, her brothers were about seven and 10 years old. And just by luck, uh, she became the first person to be processed at Ellis Island. And for that, she got a $10 gold piece, which was a lot of money in that day. And she got there with her two brothers. Uh, the rest of her family had already come to the United States. She died very young, actually. She was about less than 50 years old. And in 1897, another fire destroyed all the buildings on Ellis Island um, and burned almost all the immigration records from 1855 to 1897. So when you go to look for your ancestors, you're not, you may not be able to find them because they may well have been um, destroyed on the fire. Fortunately, nobody died in the fire um, and the facility was rebuilt using fireproof materials and reopened in 1900. So it took them almost three years to reopen it. And approximately 12 million immigrants came through Ellis Island. The peak year was 1907 where more than a million people came through Ellis Island. It was a pretty busy uh, place at that point. And here's a picture of Ellis Island and where it lies. Um, and here you see uh, the arrows pointing to it. Now I show this picture really for a selfish reason because I was uh, born and raised in Bayonne, New Jersey. So, uh, Ellis Island was there. Um, Ellis Island, 3.3 uh, acres in the beginning, it lies almost in the middle of the Hudson. And um, both New York and New Jersey always claimed uh, ownership of the island. And in 1998, the case actually went to the Supreme Court. And the court ruled mostly for New Jersey. Um, and only the oldest part was declared to be uh, owned by uh, New York State. Uh, but it's still the only ferry that goes there, even to this day, is still from uh, the battery. And here gives you an idea of where the uh, larger portion of people came from Europe to the United States. Uh, Poland, the Ukraine, Bulgaria, Russia. Um, these were where the big um, crowds came from. About two years ago, uh, my daughter called and uh, she asked me where uh, our uh, ancestors came from in, in um, Europe. And I said, Romania. And uh, my granddaughter, my daughter said, no, Poland. So I called my sister to be the arbitrator. She said Austria. Um, so we never knew. Uh, I don't know about all of your experiences, but um, our grandparents didn't really talk about it. 
It didn't, it just wasn't one of the things and we weren't smart enough to ask the questions. And so all these things that we might have been able to know about their situation, how they got here, where they traveled to, et cetera, uh, kind of lost in time. I could not find either my grandfather or my grand, uh, uh, grandmother on my um, father's side. And on my mother's side, it was hopeless. Um, and how many immigrants came to the United States? This give you an idea. In 1860, the population of the United States was about 31 and a half million people. Between 1865 and 1920, almost 30 million immigrants came to the United States. So we essentially, uh, we being the immigrants, um, essentially, uh, increase the population by 30, 40 percent. And here are the kinds of um, posters that the uh, companies that were doing uh, selling the sailings would have all over the place. This one is advertising a, um, uh, a voyage from Genoa in Italy to New York. Um, there were uh, a lot, you know, it wasn't just Ellis Island, by the way. Um, there were um, lots of uh, immigration ports uh, in the United States, but probably someone just around 75% of the people who came to the United States in the period between about 1880, 1890 to 1920 or so came through Ellis Island. And they estimate that every one, one in every four people in the United States have some connection to Ellis Island. So you see that, and here's Liverpool, um, lots of uh, ships left from, the, from England, and a landing card, which you had to have in order to get um, off the ship. And this, this to me is one of the more uh, interesting uh, uh, kind of historical stories, which I, I'm going to pursue at some point in time. But you see the people in this picture, they're walking, they're going to a port, they don't have a car, they don't have Uber, and they don't have Lyft. Um, they may get to a train station, but they still have to get there. And they're walking. For the most part, they're not taking public transportation because it doesn't exist. Um, so this was a real trek for people. Uh, during that period of time. And this is Liverpool Harbor, and all these ships are going to take people uh, to and across the ocean. And this is what a sailing ship would look like. In the early days, I think I mentioned it, uh, the trip could take six to eight weeks. But by the 1880s, 1890s, they had steamships and it reduced the trip to about 10 to 15 days. So it was a lot faster and people were a lot healthier uh, when they got home. And this is the Frisia, which was a, uh, a German ship, um, which was built uh, in about 1865, 1870. And it, was, um, it had sails and it was also steam driven. And so you had steamships during that period. And that's when the trip became a lot easier. Um, but uh, so the Frisia rigged and sails 90, and here's the passenger distribution. 91st class, 132nd class, and 600 in steerage. So what they did is they, and I, I'll, I'll tell you, Steerage cost about $30. Second class cost about $50. And first class could run to up to, up to about $150, depending what the amenities were uh, and the fancy, um, uh, uh, fancier ships. Something that's uh, ships with swimming pools. And most immigrants came to the United States by crossing the Atlantic Ocean in the steerage areas of the ships which means that they were below deck for in the early days for four or five weeks. But uh, with the uh, advent of the steamships, they got made the trip in, as I said, 
uh, seven to 12 days. And then in, in, at um, uh, Ellis Island, they had their fire in 1897. And again, records were, um, they, 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 all the buildings were made from Georgia pine and they just burned. And it, this, this was a much more devastating fire. Um, and this is what the new Ellis Island looked like. It's all fireplace, uh, fireproof, and it gives you some idea of uh, how it looked, and I'll show you a little bit more. And here's one of the things. When people bought their steerage, even their steerage uh, ticket, the line, whatever it was, whether it was Cunard or White Star or any other line, if their passengers got rejected, if they got rejected, this, the uh, uh, passenger line was responsible to taking them back to Europe and they didn't, didn't, there was no pay. So they had an interest in keeping these people alive and in healthy. So here you see this uh, picture of a, a woman in steerage getting a shot, getting some kind of medication uh, to hope that uh, she would make it in and, and get in. And if you talk about um, percentage of people who were rejected, of the 12 million people, less than 4% of the people were sent back. So almost everybody got through over the years. And this is a dining room. And guess which class is at that dining room? That's a first class dining room. You could see the maitre d' and uh, white tablecloths and so forth. And this is what it looked like in steerage. You could see the contrast. You could see and only imagine what it smelled like um, in these places because it, uh, there were sick people, there were people who die, uh, there were people who gave dysentery. I mean, there's just every possible uncomfortable um, uh, way you would find in steerage. And these are some um, steerage people waiting outside uh, to get onto the ships. And this is what it looks like. Look, this is another meal. <laughs> you can see the kind of conditions and you could also see the tilt um, uh, on the ship because there must've been waves. And um, you see another woman getting a shot in steerage. So they were conscious of it, um, but they didn't provide uh, particularly uh, nutritious food or, or a lot of food. And that's what it looked like on a, on a um, brutally uh, high seas day. They got to hold on to everything, the water comes in uh, and nobody cares. I mean, it's as simple as that, except for the doctor, I guess. And then comes the big day. Here comes the big day. You see on the, on the left-hand side there, is the Statue of Liberty. These people are getting their first sight of the Statue of Liberty, 1884, um, which becomes the symbol of America, the sing uh, symbol of hope. You know, the streets are gonna be paved with gold and these people are gonna survive. And other pictures, we have with the hats on uh, and so forth. And again, by this time on the arrival, they are, the people are pouring out from steerage onto the deck. And this is uh, 1904 arrivals. And you can just see they're all lined up. If you've been to Ellis Island, you've seen the Great Hall. And it's called the registry, which is where they had to go for processing. Um, and I'll give you some idea what they had to go. And here, this is what it looks like as they are arriving. And whether you've ever been encountered this, when the ship comes in, it doesn't go to Ellis Island. It goes to New York, to the Battery, to New York Harbor. 
it's too big a ship in almost all cases to dock at Ellis Island. So what happens is the ship docks in Manhattan and the uh, first and second class people, they leave the ship at that time. They don't go through the process that the steerage people are gonna go through, except if they're sick or you know, they have some thing, but they quickly go through and they never see Ellis Island. So if you have bought a first class ticket and, and a second class ticket, you didn't go through the, you didn't get to Ellis Island. You got off the ship and you went on your way. The others then went from barges uh, from New York, uh, from, the, from the battery to Ellis Island. It's a whole different process. And these are the barges. These barges picked the people up in Manhattan and took them out to the 1920s. This, this photograph stated June of 1920. And there again, you can see the barge. This is, this is where people got to when they finally arrived at Ellis Island. The people in steerage never get off the boat, never get off the ship until they get transferred and brought to Ellis Island. This is a, you know, group of elderly passengers going from the barge um, to the um, to Ellis Island. And here they are. These are uh, these are probably first class or second class people who are leaving, and just they're just going on their way. Again, now people here are on Ellis Island and they're lined up. There's a lot of lining up. There's a lot of waiting in time until you get processed. This is this actually on Ellis Island. This is a uh, where they would feed anybody who was uh, detained was fed, and those who were not detained, then they just went. They were just transferred again from Ellis Island uh, to uh, New York Harbor to, to Manhattan. But people who were detained, detained actually had a pretty good meal. And this is just the joy of, uh, you know, coming off the ship. And again, same kind of thing. And here they are uh, just lining up to get into the registry uh, to be processed. And uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll go, this is kind of the elephant in the room. And some of you are gonna, um, in my opinion, uh, going to uh, contest me on this, but you see what this guy is doing. This this workman over here. Let me just see the next one. Uh, he's handing out tags that are going to go on the shirt or blouse or whatever of every person who comes through Ellis Island, and that tag is going to identify that person, their name, where they came from, the ship that they arrive on, and um, they're not going to change their name. That's the point that I'm going to come to. There is no record of names being changed at Ellis Island. Contrary to what your ancestors might have told you, uh, the, the inspectors did not have the authority. They knew everybody's name because it was on the manifest. They knew where they came from. Um, and probably, probably, Many people changed their name after they got off the boat on New York Harbor, after they got onto Manhattan. But when they talked about things, they lumped everything together as the Ellis Island experience. And if they changed their name a month, six months afterwards, and you know what the reasons they would change their name was to become Americanized, to get a different kind of job and so forth, uh, looking at a, at a way. Uh, they lumped it together and get the impression. But, and there may have been some bribery involved. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to argue that nobody got away with it. But the literature says that just about nobody got their name changed. The old story would have been, uh, Gee, I went to the inspector and uh, my name was uh, Shlomo And the guy says, what's your name? Shlomo He says, 
I, I don't know what you're saying. They said, what, what, what kind of job did you have in Europe? He said, I worked in a, I worked in a bakery. Okay, you change your name. Your name's now Baker. So people who were baking, but that's not how it happened. It didn't, it didn't happen that way. They had inspectors um, who spoke about between 12 and 14 um, languages. Not, there was only one guy that spoke 12 uh, that I, I ever read about. Uh, one guy spoke 12 uh, lectures, uh, languages. So that's you know, kind of the elephant in the room. And I'm sure some of you are saying, no, nah, he's wrong because my grandfather told me and my great grandfather told me and it's everybody knows our name was uh, Slomowitz and now it's uh, uh, Stevens or some other thing. But that's these these tags belie that uh, thing. And they're exam awaiting examination on Ellis Island. Uh, this is just a picture. Uh, William Howard Taft actually uh, visited uh, uh, Ellis Island in 1910. And by the way, Teddy Roosevelt, when he became president, uh, right after 1900, he was instrumental in uh, cleaning up a lot of the uh, fraud and, uh, and uh, ill will in, uh, on the island and so forth, made it a much better place uh, to live or to get to. And here's Fiorello LaGuardia, a name you probably all know, you probably uh, I've seen the pictures. He actually worked as an interpreter on Ellis Island. He, was, he worked uh, during the day at Ellis Island from 1907 to 1910 while he was going to law school at night and ultimately would become. So he spoke four languages plus English. He spoke Italian, uh, German, Yiddish, and Croatian. So that's the kind of person that was an inspector at that time. And he was a big advocate um, of, of treating uh, people well. Remember, maybe some of you remember him reading the newspapers during the depression and people just waiting outside the fence. And here's what it looks like early in the day. And if you look carefully at the picture, every single person, has a tag on their piece of clothing, everybody. And when they got to the registry, when they got to the person who was gonna process them through, they had a, 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 um, a list of 29 questions and they had it in every language. Uh, and the questions were asked, I, I'll give you some examples of the uh, kind of questions. They asked their religion, they asked if they had relatives in the United States, uh, they asked how much money, because you had to have a certain amount of money, uh, the source of passage money, uh, were they literate, what kind of job they had had, and some statement that the candidate for acceptance into the United States did not believe in the practice of polygamy or anarchy. That's what they had to attest to. And so everybody got asked those questions. And if there was an issue, then they had to go to the legal department and then they might get detained and so forth. But again, only a small portion of people did not get um, accepted into the United States. And again, you see the, the people waiting. And here's a group uh, coming up to the inspectors and they're gonna ask them the questions uh, and they'll have to get the answers they're looking for. Same kind of thing, again, waiting, I just want to get to, and they weren't just from Eastern Europe, okay? Uh, there were lots of, I mean, the Italians came, about 4 million Italians, four to 5 million Italians came during this 1880 to 1900 period. Uh, Jews came from all over Eastern Europe in this, in, in this period. Um, in 1911, by the way, uh, Ellis Island put in a kosher kitchen because they had so many Jews who came here, Orthodox Jews, they actually put in a kosher kitchen. And this is a Dutch family. And this is a family of seven with the mother and the father, seven sons and one daughter. And again, parents have on the uh, tags. And these two young people, these are in other pictures. I don't know who these kids were, but they were very, seemed to be photogenic. 
And here comes the examination. The medical team would give an examination to each person. And if they found something that they didn't like, they would put a chalk mark on the person's coat. An X, suspected mental defect, uh, defects. Uh, C, conjunctivitis, um, face issues, a goiter, a heart, hernia. And the big hall, the registry, was upstairs and they didn't have an elevator. And one of the reasons they did that was be so the inspectors could watch these people as they walked up and down the stairs to notice anybody with an infirmity and put those people for further inspection. What they didn't want people who um, had serious infections or uh, you know, lost a limb or something, they didn't want anybody that they could make the argument that those people would go on the dole, that they'd have to be taken care of by the state. They were very conscious of this. And you can see all the various um, issues there. And well, by 1917, they were real quick. They could do it in, in a couple of seconds. Um, if, the, if their problem was curable, fine. If it wasn't, they went to an, an island hospital. Um, and you see them. And I, I, the picture on the lower left here, I'll, I'll get a better picture of them. Um, this is the eye exam. And what they're looking for is trachoma. I don't know if you've ever heard of trachoma. Trachoma. It's not. Uh, it's pretty much gone. And it was a bacterial disease. And if you got it, you were likely to go blind and lose an eye. And so, if you had this disease, you weren't getting in. You were going to be sent back. And trachoma was the single uh, problem which sent people back to Europe because it was, if it was definable, they could catch it and so forth. And this device called a button hook was used by Ellis Island physicians for the trachoma examination. So if you go back here, guy, you can't see it very well. The guy has this button hook in his hand and he's lifting the eyebrow with this metal and probably not very clean uh, device to check the eyes of the people. So this was one of the you know, extremely difficult um, part of the examination. There's the button hook again. Oh, there you go, you get a picture of what it looked like. The guy's you know, lifting the eyelid on the woman. Oh, this, is, this is from the Godfather movie. Um, Godfather 2, I think, yeah, Godfather 2. And if you watch it carefully, this, this young man in the picture is Don Corleone as a youngster. He's coming here to the United States. I hope you can hear the music and so forth. There's not any uh, conversation, but he's on the ship and they're gonna get off the ship. They're all staring in awe at the statue. Now they're coming up in the line to be processed. There's Don Carleone. And he X's his jacket saying with that, that he has some deformity or some illness and he gets separated from his mother and I guess it's, it ends at this point. Um, so that just gives you an idea. I mean, that's a modern, uh, thing, but it's exactly not as clean and as nice as it looks in the, the little part of the movie, um, but he gets separated. And there's lots of stories about, um, oh, for instance, uh, a woman might be taken with a daughter into a private room with a nurse, and the nurse tells the, daughter, the, the mother she has to 
disrobe, she has to take all her clothes off. Well, in those days, children never saw their parents naked. So this was a, you know, a traumatic experience uh, for the mother and for the daughter. What they're doing in this picture is the other disease that was most prominent and in the uh, examinations was tuberculosis. And if there's any sign of that, they're going back. Um, so that's what they're doing here. They also look for typhus. Uh, they, they look for a few things, but the two big ones were trachoma, um, tuberculosis, and whooping cough. You know, some of the things we don't see anything of uh, these days. And this is the woman's ward. A woman might be, you know, a woman might be pregnant, which they didn't send them back necessarily for, but they put them into some kind of isolation for a while. This is what Ellis Island became. Um, I, I'm going to go back here. It's just a, 1936. But the point I'm going to make here is that by 1924, immigration just basically collapsed because the United States passed laws limiting immigrants coming into the country. Uh, they had the quota law uh, in 1922, I guess it was, which said that immigrants will be allowed here based on the population of the countries they came from. And so in this case, the first year, the, the law was 3%, a number equal to 3% of the number of people who, let's say, came from Sweden, just as an example, based on the 1910 uh, census. And two years later, they changed it to 2% based on the population from the 1890 census. So if, if the majority of people came from, let's say, Germany, um, and they came here in 1840, by 1920, that, that population had grown. If the people came from 1890 or 1900, which the Italians and the Jews and, and so forth, those numbers are much smaller. So in essence, they just were knocking off uh, people's opportunity to come to the United States. The baggage room, oddly enough, one of the things that they did well by everybody's um, uh, definition is they didn't lose people's baggage. I mean, Delta Airlines loses their, uh, their baggage more often than they did in on Ellis Island. And again, 1900, and they're just sitting outside waiting to get into the registry line. And here's the, uh, the final discharge. These people, when they get past that fence or past these gates, they are free. And one of the first things they'll find is the money exchange. And again, they still have their tags on. These people are not giving up those tags very well. Um, and money, but this is, this is an honest uh, uh, action, but you can see the groups there waiting. And here's just a postcard that I was in, in one of the things. This is some uh, Americans, former Russian uh, Jews, welcoming the Jewish population coming into the new world. So they come with you know, gifts and so forth. Um, Ellis Island in the back. And they, once they're across that little piece of water, um, they've made it here. And what, what, what happened was, in the period first of World War I, and then a little bit through that, in 1916, for instance, there was this huge explosion in the harbor. Actually, it was on the Jersey, the New Jersey side. It was actually in Jersey City on the harbor. And it was done by German spies uh, to blow up a, a facility which had munitions and so forth. And that scared people people began to get afraid of foreigners. And this is one of them. So you got this, Black Tom was the name of the island. And here's just some of the devastation caused by the uh, Black Tom explosions. And in the 1920s, in 1920s, they had what's known historically as Red Scare. There was a 
very virulent um, explosion of fear of foreigners. And uh, this is actually in terms of historical times, this is the beginning of the J. Edgar Hoover era with the FBI. And it was one day, one Sunday, that they arrested 8,000 people as suspected insect uh, anarchists. Uh, it's the, um, the, the uh, various uh, events of the times. Uh, Sacco and Vanzetti would be later on in the 1920s, but all um, of the same ilk, or all this uh, xenophobia, fear of foreigners, um, and that cut into it, the war cut into it, and then the anti, uh, anti-immigrants, especially an what they considered anarchists, uh, and, and so forth. So that's what you got uh, during that period. So that by 1924, 12 million people came through Ellis Island from uh, 1892, uh, 1894 to 1950, 1892 to 1954, uh, uh, 12 million people. Between 1924 and the closing of Ellis Island, only another 2.3 million came. So 10 million came before 1924 and for the period longer than the, the time from 94 to 1924, uh, it, it, it devastated the uh, immigrant population. And what also happened during the period is, and this uh, window uh, illustrates to some extent, the differences of what people looked like and how they dressed. You got lots of people who came from uh, uh, Serbia, Asia, um, uh, Iraq and Iran, and, you know, and various countries that not much population came. The people did come. And a lot of people during an earlier period came from Canada. So they came from lots of different places. But for the most part, for the most part, it was a white immigration during the early years. And, you know, Lots of movies. I don't know Ellis Island in the movies. This was uh, the famous uh, uh, Charlie Chaplin movie, The Immigrant. And you know, I, I couldn't list the number of um, uh, movies that have dealt with the copy. And then um, in um, nine, in late 1980s and 1990, um, there was a restoration of the Statue of Liberty, and then ultimately. Uh, of Ellis Island. Um, Ellis Island was like those, those pictures which showed it all broken down and, and ignored and so forth. And uh, uh, President Johnson asked uh, Lee Iacocca to lead the uh, plea for finance to do this and create the Ellis Island Immigration Mu Museum. And, and he was successful. First, they did the Statue of Liberty, then they did Ellis Island, and it opened about two years later. And I don't know if any of you have been there. Uh, this is one of the differences between doing a live lecture and doing a Zoom lecture. In a live lecture, I would ask that question and you know, X number of people would raise their hands and yeah, yeah, I did that and so forth. Uh, that doesn't happen normally in a, a Zoom lecture. Um, but this is what it is now. You can see Ellis Island on the left, Statue of Liberty on the right. And it is the Statue of Liberty and uh, Ellis Island uh, National Monument. So they're, they're linked together. And the financing came first for the statue, for the refurbishing of the Statue of Liberty, which uh, uh, was up in 1884, and the refurbishing ultimately of Ellis Island. And there's a picture of Ellis Island as it looks today. And these are, they have an Ellis Island Medal of Honor. These people all have given substantial sums of money. Some came through Ellis Island and others, uh, you know, had relatives who did so. And it's another one of the walls. You could recommend uh, Martina Navratilova, Martin Scorsese, um, Madeleine Albright, Esli Iacocca, Colin Powell, uh, Seinfeld, you know, Bob Hope and, uh, Springsteen. And I like to finish the lecture all the time, and it, it works a little bit better, um, you know, when there's some people. I'm going to read you um, these names, and you're going to tell me, 
and you're going to score it by your your own honesty. I'm going to you're going to read these names, and these were all the names that these people came through Ellis Island with, and every one of them changed their names again after spending time uh, in the United States. So the first one is Leslie Hop, who I hate, who was originally, or who became, I'm sorry. Anybody got an idea? Speak, no, you don't have to speak. Bob Hope, easy one. Israel Balin, you're all gonna know who that, who that is. You got that one? Irving Berlin. There you go. This is a tough one. I'll be very impressed if you get this one. Moses Teichman. Don't know that. Hmm? Anybody else? Want to give it a shot? No. Arthur Murray. Oh, for God's sakes. Moses Teichman became Arthur Murray and became the dance empresario. Arthur Stanley Jefferson. Stanley Jefferson. So Adam Leach, I know. It's Gary Cooper. Stanley is in the name. I'll give you a hint. Stan what? Laurel of Laurel and Hardy. Lily Shaquong. Anybody want to guess? Lily Tomlin. No, no, she's too young. She, she, she would be born. Lily Pons. Claudette Colbert. Oh my goodness. Oh my God. This one, I think most people. Everybody know. knows Alec Leach. Yep. Yeah, uh, Harry Grant. Harry Grant. Mm -hmm. Angelo Siciliano came here in 1903. Somebody Tony said, Bennett. No. His name, his, his original family name was, was something like Benedetti. Charles Atlas. Hmm. Remember Charles Atlas? Mm -hmm. The muscle guy? Sure. Okay. Now this one is, is, uh, is, is relatively, Emmanuel Goldenberg. Stanley Goldberg. <laughs> no, that's just his brother. No. <laughs> Emmanuel Goldenberg. Edward G. Robinson. Oh, right, 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 right. And this one I think everybody will get, or a lot of people will get. Izor Danielovich Dembski. Kirk Danny K. No, someone Kirk, has it. Someone has Kirk it. Kirk Douglas. Kirk Douglas. Oh, Kirk Douglas. Oh. All right. And the last one that I have um, Anna Maria Luisa Italiano. Anna Maffo? Anna Maria Luisa Italiano. Who? Anna Moffo? No. 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 Anne Bancroft. Oh, for heaven's sakes. There you go. And I, I don't know, a lot of famous people obviously came. I mean, Henny Youngman came through Ellis Island. Uh, Charlie Chaplin came through Ellis Island. So did anybody get three right? No. No, one lady right here did very well. Three's a, three's a good answer. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I hope you learned something. I hope, you know. Very enjoyable. Uh, very thank enjoyable. You. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very enjoyable. Thank you. Before you guys leave, don't leave yet, everybody. We have questions and answers. Right. And then we have to do the poll of what he's going to do next. But um, Mr. Schlesinger, someone wanted to know, you know, you know I'm trying to re research. Um, was there a particular time that there was the um, arrival? Did they do anything special for the arrival of the Holocaust survivors? Well, they have a wall of honor. But for the most part, the answer is no. No. For the most part, the answer is uh, very close to where um, Castle Gardens is, is the uh, Museum of um, Jewish Heritage. Jewish Heritage. Um, and that, and that takes care of it. So that's right that was. within, it's within a walking distance. And I have to tell you, um, I did go there and I had the wonderful experience of 
going to watch or be in attendance of uh, Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish, in Yiddish. And somebody said, well, do you understand Yiddish? And I said, not really, but when the music starts and they're singing, I know what they're saying, you know, because we all have heard the music more than enough times. And if you ever get a chance to see it, and maybe it's on, uh, you know, uh, you know, one of the video things or something. It's a really very, very heartwarming. It was a very small stage. I think it had 320 seats. And what? Oh, you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Anybody question? Anybody? You can unmute yourself for the question. Um, I'm going to start off with is like, how much was the? Um, how much did it cost for some of these travelers to uh, come to Ellis Island? It was about thirty dollars. Uh, for steerage, which is a lot of money, uh, about $50, $60 for second. And this two, two people. And then it could be, it could be even up to about $150 for first class because they got first class uh, treatment. No, uh, as far as I know, I'm sure somebody got first class got uh, sent back because they may have been so visibly ill or something, uh, but they were treated with uh, white gloves in that period. So, and that um, kind of so before everybody goes, let me just put this polling question and then we can go ahead and ask some more questions. So I'm just gonna put this polling question and um, let me just slide so here it is. We're gonna relaunch this poll. So you guys can see it. It says, uh, what topic would you like to hear in April? The uh, 1964 oh. World's Fair. All of them. Grand Central Terminal. Oh, all of them. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have the summertime and everything like that, yeah. but let's go ahead and find something for April. And then, you know, in April, we'll... Which one would you like? Uh, okay. what are the so, which do you want? Eh? World's Fair, Grand Central World's Station. Fair. World's oh, yeah. Fair. The World's Fair. Downtown or the History Central Park. Yeah. I, I personally have my two favorites, but I love everything. And, and he even has more. He has more um, lectures on this, too. The 64 so, World's Fair would be good. All right, we only have 19 of you out of 69. That's, here we go, World's everybody. Fair. This is good practice for our trivia night, everybody, in March, okay? We're probably going to do trivia night on uh, polling, not, or we'll see. But uh, all right, we've got 28 people, Mr. Schlesinger. Cool. 31. We'll stop Damn, it. Put it back again. Pardon? Have put that, the, what do you want? The, <clears throat> put the back poll? the list again of places, of things oh. that we'd like to hear. Well, I Did haven't closed it yet. You might have accidentally just taken it off your screen if you hit select. If you already voted, it's probably no, off your I screen. No, I see, you know, the list of names. You already, you already voted. You want to say? Yeah, you, you must have already voted. Yeah. Oh, I did. I did one, but I thought of another one. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is just uh, a sampling. Okay, everybody, I'm just going to end this and we'll share the results real quick. And all right, so. All right, can you see that, Mr. Slash? Yeah, we win. All right. <laughs> Good choice. I think people. World's Fair. The World's Fair. Actually, I, mean, I have done a preview. One of the, so. one of the reasons I, that I, 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 I think a whole lot of people in your community probably went to the 1960s. Yep. Yep. We certainly did. And what, I did. I and did. What famous piece of I art, guess I did too. What famous piece of art was displayed there and probably the only time it ever was. The Unisphere? Interesting enough, for a long time, I thought the uh, Mona Lisa was there too, but it was, yeah, um, it was in the United States just before that. Just before that, Jackie Kennedy was uh, inspira uh, uh, part of uh, bringing it to the yeah. United States. But yeah. the Pieta is something that mm -hmm. it'll never leave uh, uh, St. Peter's. All right, everybody. Anybody else have any uh, last One minute question. questions? One question. Can you hear me, Tammy? Yes, ma'am, we can. Oh, do people, was there a period where people had to be sponsored in order to come to this country? Mm -hmm. Yep. Not in this immigration process that we're talking now. These mm -hmm. people, if they could afford a ticket, they would be able to come here. Didn't, right. 
Um, I was talking I think, to him, think, Mrs. Robinson, yeah. about the book that we just read. And about that, that kind of reminded me of Ellis Island where they did have to be sponsored and not yes. here. That's why I thought about the question, yes. Well. It was a. Well, they, they, it helped if they had a job, you know, that they had been promised a job, but they still had to uh, go through the process. That's what I'm trying to tell you. But you know, I I Unless see. they were first class, then they didn't need anything. They just walked off the ship. They just took their bag and walked off the ship. I remember my grandfather sponsored a relative to come here. Oh, that's so the bridge who plays that's with four homes. That, 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 mm -hmm. Marilyn, you have to the answer to that is, is like Uncle Abe. the statement, as you as the, the words as you used it, someone sponsored someone to come here. Yes. Which really probably only meant that he gave him the money to come here. Maybe. Okay. You, you know what I mean? Yes. Uh, in, in other words, it didn't enhance his chances. Well, it did enhance his chances because he had, he had a job to look forward to. One of the big concerns was with anybody who came is that those people would go on what they called the dole. That means that the, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, government, the government would have to subsidize them. And they didn't want that. So using your language, it's more like um, he gave him the money and he promised to get a job, which is not to be all an end all, but that's what sponsor would have meant at that yes, point. That's what happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what do you got? Steve, I think also uh, the Asians did have to be sponsored. Right. When they were able to come later. Oh, later they, on. But they, they they still had they had to be sponsored. But, but their, their their plight was uh, much worse than you might even think. Um, first of all, they only wanted men. Okay, they didn't want women. They wanted yeah. men to do heavy work. The the uh, uh, gold rush. They didn't even want them to gold wash. The people who were painting and looking for gold didn't want the Chinese to come. So they often lead or sometimes killed. Um, once the Transcontinental Railroad was uh, completed, uh, they, 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 they being the uh, Chinese, um, there was nothing for them to do in California. So some of them came to New York, some of them you know, fanned out around the country and they couldn't even own businesses and property until oh, after World War II. Oh, yeah. They were limited on that. Uh, and, uh, so that. It was very difficult. And you take things like, you know, they talk about, uh, and I, I don't want to really get into any particular kind of thing, but up until maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there were maybe in a New York City police department, we're talking thousands and thousands of people. There were maybe 30 people, 30 Chinese people. I mean, they didn't get those jobs, you know, the, the, all the, you know, the Irish got them and, and, and some of the Russian Jews got them. lots of different people got them. But it comes down to the same thing that uh, <laughs> causes prejudices in different ways they're identifiable and th that's a big issue. Um, so, you know, anybody else? You've been a great audience, you cheered and, you know, thank no, you. Uh, no, oh, I, I- Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope- Very much, that was very well done. Thank you. Very, very informative. Thank you. And you'll thank love, you. You'll love the 19, if you went to the 1964 World's Fair, you will, love the lectures and, yes. and the pictures and so forth. I went to the 1964 World's Fair and 